Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. I am Hilary Seligman. I am the co-director of the CTSI's uh, New Impact Core, which you um, can learn about a little bit here. I am really um, privileged to start our conversation today about women in science and academia with an introduction by Catherine Lucy. Dr. Lucy is UCSF's Vice Dean for Education and Executive Vice Dean for the School of Medicine. I think more importantly, she has been a friend, a mentor, and a role model for many, many women in science and medicine, including myself, um, both in her individual mentoring relationships and in her leadership positions at the Association of American Medical Colleges and American Board of Internal Medicine. We have asked Dr. Lucy to start us off today to frame our discussion uh, that we're going to be having with Marion Nessel by reflecting on the status of women at UCSF. So thank you, Dr. Lucy, for um, kicking us off today. Thanks, Dr. Pelican. Um, it's really, it's a pleasure and an honor, and I'm a bit awed uh, to be able to introduce our amazing speaker here today, um, Marion Nessel, who for many of us has been an incredible um, role model, even at a distance, um, those of us who had, haven't had a chance to meet with her individually. Um, as you all know, Marion has been a vanguard as a scientist and an advocate who really founded the field of food studies, moving us beyond a narrow focus on the biochemical aspects of food disorders to an understanding of the complex ecosystem um, of social and economic uh, contributions to those biochemical disorders. Her work, your work, Dr. Nussel, has really truly been transformative and disruptive. She's been fearless in attacking corporate greed and the role of fast food, big soda, and other industries whose marketing of toxic products has caused so much pain and suffering in our communities across the nation. Her policy and advocacy work as a scientist highlighted the importance of system solutions to issues that make wise individual choices about good nutrition virtually impossible systems thinker before people thought about systems. Uh, and so in many ways, she was a vanguard about systems biology and also the social systems that contribute to disease. When I think about um, Dr. Nussel, I'm reminded of Mary Catherine Bateson, an anthropologist and uh, daughter of Margaret Mead, who I found out yesterday actually passed away just last year. She wrote a book that I read about 20 years ago when I gave my first talk about women in science at The Ohio State University. And that book was called Composing a Life. I don't know how many of you have read this book. Um, you have to go to like green, the green bookstore in order to find it. I, it may not be on, ad, on Amazon anymore, but I'd really encourage people to read it. And in it, um, she reflects on how crafting our academic systems to be in sync with our lives, rather than vice versa, where we expect our lives to sync up with the academic systems, could be a solution to the rampant sexism and misogyny in the academy that limits the number of women who have successful careers in science and limits the number of women who are assigned to leadership positions in institutions, organizations, and governmental agencies. When you read the, um, the book flap on Marion's new book, um, which I was hoping she would have here for copies to sign, but um, maybe we'll just figure that out some other time. Um, I want to say that Mary Nussel is living proof of the importance of composing a life. Uh, her contributions to the world began, um, like many, many women, with childbearing and childrearing, and then moved to bench science, education, including at UCS UCSF, to a government policy advisor, to institutional leadership, and ultimately to be the founder of a field of a discipline. Um, that is so important to our understanding of much of the causes of morbidity and mortality in the world today related to um, over and under nutrition and metabolic syndrome. Hers is a life that is fully composed with significant contributions at every stage, all linked to that early groundbreaking inspiration that food is not only fuel, but a cultural, social, and economic phenomena that must be nurtured and structured for health for all. She was at UCSF in, from 1976 to 86 and actually overlapped with me when I was a resident here. Um, and during her time at UCSF, she authored what I think was probably the first um, report on the status of women at UCSF, highlighting challenges faced by women and the resulting missed opportunities not only for our institution but for science in general. 
I wish I could say that all of the issues that Marion identified in that early report on women in science have been fixed in today's UCSF or in today's society. Certainly, a lot of progress has been made. We have wonderful leaders here like Hillary, um, and many of you in the audience are, are young scientists and young women scientists, and that's actually wonderful. But I want to talk about three levels of challenges for women, the social levels, our professional levels, and then our challenges at UCSF. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, Marion's talk about how she's viewing these and what solutions she might have in place. We really experienced in, pand in the pandemic the entrenched social belief that women are entirely responsible for caregiving um, in families. Um, even in two career families, um, we expect the women somehow to super heroically um, put in a full day of work at work and then a full day of work at home. And yes, there are exceptions to the rule. Um, Same-sex couples seem to do better than heterosexual couples. Um, and certainly some people in the younger generation are doing better than those of us in the older generation do. But that is not a universal phenomena. We still see that women feel, whether right or wrongly, that society expects them to be the caregivers for children and for parents. And this is to sometimes the detriment of their careers. Some of you may know UC Berkeley faculty Marianne Mason, who wrote a, another fantastic book, Do Babies Matter in Academia? And the answer is yes, they matter a lot. For men PhDs and men PhD students, welcoming a child into their home, whether through adoption or through um, pregnancy, is a benefit to their career. They appear more stable and are more likely to advance quickly through their PhD, whereas women who bear the children um, actually fare poorly with a lot less, a lot more women dropping out of the PhD um, career or the, PA, or the track towards the PhD. Recent studies in other industries also show how deeply entrenched this social belief that women must carry the weight of the home and caregiving. There was a recent study that documented that the more a woman out earns her husband, so has a higher salary than her husband in heterosexual couples, the more housework that that woman does. With a, with a hypothesis that people are trying to compensate in a feminine way for undermining the man as, a, as a, um, the provider for the family. These are hard things to fix. They are the same complex problems um, that Marion identified as having social, economic, and individual choice issues related to food and nutrition. And so we're deeply interested in what she has to say about this. When we look at our profession, we are slightly doing better, and people point to the fact that we have 50% or more women in most medical school classes now. In fact, UCSF this year, we had 54% women. Um, this is fantastic celebratory news, but it's also a problem, because when you see a lot of women around, you think the problem of women in science and women in medicine has been solved. What we have now as women in science and medicine is in many ways parity without power. There is a lot of us in fundamentally frontline career caregiving, frontline caretaking, healthcare delivery, and scientific endeavors, and we are not ascending to leadership roles at the rate that we should expect. For example, um, in the US today, of the 151 medical schools in the country, 18% are headed by a woman as the dean, 18%. Um, we, that is a soaring difference than the 14% we saw 20 years ago. And that was a sarcastic comment if you didn't, if you didn't get it. Um, uh, 18%. Uh, many will say it's a pipeline problem. There just aren't that, you know, we have to wait for those 50% of the women in medical school to mature to be leaders. But I will say that when I went to medical school and graduated in 1982, 25% of my class was women. There are sufficient women of my age Women who in that period of time for the 40 years since 1982 could have taken five or six maternity leaves and still be capable of becoming a leader. And yet we haven't managed to figure out how to let them lead at the highest level of our academic institutions. And that's to our detriment because women are uniquely suited um, in the way that they approach leadership to dealing with the types of complex adaptive problems that we have facing us today. Things that don't have command and control solutions things that require influence, relationship building, sense making, all of these things are found to be, in study after study, more 
uh, often found in women leaders and in men leaders. Now here at UCSF, um, we are quite similar. We're making progress, but at a, at a rate that is truly glacial. If we wait for the, that increase from 14 to 18 percent to take its slope normally, it will be well into um, the 22nd century where, before we achieve any hope of parity at leadership. 50 percent of our workforce are women across the UCSS system. That includes in the health system. Um, very low percentage of women are leaders across the health system or in the schools of medicine um, and pharmacy. For example, of our 40 plus chairs and directors, that is of clinical departments, research institutes, centers, and basic science departments, 40 of them, six are women, six. Now, um, what you will see, which is also what we see across the country too, if you look at roles like I have, um, I'm the Vice Dean for Education, there's the Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs, there's lots of Associate Deans for Students, for Curriculum. Um, many of those service roles are filled by women. But those are not the roles that lead to a Dean's position. Even though they have Dean in their title, it is very rare for a Vice Dean in any of those environments to ascend to a Dean's position. Perhaps the one person we know who has done that um, successfully is our current president of the, of the University of California, Michael Drake, who started his career at UCSF as an associate dean for admissions. That is almost unheard of. And so what we see is what Hillary Clinton described in her book, is that people are perfectly happy with women in leadership roles that serve the broader community and are subservient to the person with strategic leadership. But once they sort of knock at that top leadership um, door, they find it's closed and locked and opened only to a certain phenotype. And that is um, still, at this day and age, a male phenotype. So what do we do for this? Um, well, I'll tell you what we don't do. We don't do what we've been doing, which is we decide that what we need to do is to teach women to be better leaders. There's an inherent ridiculousness of that. We do not want to teach women to be leaders like men. We want women to lead in the way that they inherently do lead and have shown to be better at complex problems than we have. But we have this pheno phenomena where we sort of see like it must be the problem of the women. We have to fix the women. But instead, what we have to do is fix the system. We need to stop giving people leadership courses without leadership positions to, to practice in. We need to stop requiring women to demonstrate their commitment to leadership because they took a year off or two years to get an MBA and then say, you know what, you're just not quite ready for this role yet. Um, we need to, to deal with this phenotype problem. And women of my generation need to be the ones who speak out, who sponsor, who take on the generative work that Eric Erickson says is the final fulfillment of your career. Um, but we also need men in the environment to do so because they recognize that we are wasting generations of people whose leadership might actually lead us out of the problems that we're having here rather than reinforce them in medicine, in society, and in many other of the industries that, that are so, divorced of, so devoid of women in their positions. So I call on all of you, um, sit at the table, um, make your voices home. Do not feel humble about bragging about what you know. Feel confident in what you can offer. And if you see someone who is talented, sponsor them and make sure other people know that th those women are talented and should be the ones who are promoted at the next level. Don't take no for an answer and don't fall into the trap of saying, but they haven't done as many papers because they took three maternity leaves. Papers have nothing to do with leadership. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Marion. Um, I had hoped to be able to give better news about UCSF today, um, but at least we know the problems and we are working on the solutions. And hopefully with Marion's help, we'll be able to figure out something more creative to do as well. So thanks again, Hillary, for inviting me and um, I will turn it back over to you. So before we call Marion um, up here, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Lucy. I am continually in awe of your leadership, um, and you are very inspirational. Um, so we are here to celebrate the career, hear about the career today of one amazing scientist, Marion Nessel, and her work has had a tremendous impact on food policy. I want, before we start, to um, 
to tell you, and I think you've seen here, that CTSI's new impact program seeks to support researchers in doing work that makes a difference in the real world. Rather than sitting behind firewalls in difficult to decipher manuscripts that few, if any, people read. Um, and thank you, Dr. Lucy, for calling attention to the fact that manuscripts do not necessarily make the impact. By making a difference in the real world, we mean changing policies and systems that influence and constrain all of our actions and all of our behaviors. So how can we help change these policies and systems as scientists? We think it's by making sure that key evidence reaches the people who are empowered to create and maintain these policies and systems. And we are convinced through the work of people like Dr. Nessel that we as researchers and scientists can learn to be more sensitive and more responsive to the needs and the constraints of real world decision makers and policy makers. The IMPACT program, which stands for Impacting Policy by Accelerating Translation, is now open to support our community in doing this work better. We believe that authentic partnerships between researchers and real-world decision makers can promote health equity, health quality, and healthcare value. Uh, so please call on us. We're open for consultations. Our, Im our information is on the slide. It'll come back after Dr. Nessel. And I want to turn it over now to my IMPACT co-director, Laura Schmidt, uh, to bring in Dr. Nessel. Thank you. So I have the privilege of introducing the N of one. Um, and to um, say that Marion really represents what we are hoping to achieve with the IMPACT program. She is a global leader in reforming food systems through policy change. And she's done it as a women academic. And um, it's just, she's an extremely influential scientist moving mountains through uh, policy change. Um, so how did she get to this esteemed place in, in her life? Um, well, she's been through some life experiences and I'm just gonna share a few milestones. Um, Marion has gotten married at the age of 19. She has dropped out of college. She has gotten a doctorate in my molecular, molecular biology. Can't even say it. She was a founding member of the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. Uh, she's gotten divorced. She's been an associate dean in the School of Medicine, and thanks to Catherine, we know what that can mean uh, at, at UCSF. Uh, she's been a stay-at-home mom with two kids. She's also uh, worked for the Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, she has written a, a, probably a dozen books, maybe more. She can tell us the exact number. Uh, the first one was published in 1985 while she was here at UCSF a nutrition science book. And um, she spent a pandemic uh, kayaking <laughs> and writing uh, yet another book. And that's what she's here to tell us about today. Uh, what a truly remarkable woman. Uh, she's, she's grown more, not less, over the course of her 50-year career, become more influential. Um, She's an extraordinary role model for women in science, for me, for policy-engaged scientists. And uh, she shows us how women scientists in her memoir, and hopefully she'll talk about it soon, uh, how women science, scientists transform obstacles into opportunities. So let's say hi to Marion. Thank you, Laura, for that incredibly embarrassing introduction. Um, and thank you, Catherine Lucy, for a really extraordinary talk. I could have given that identical talk 40 years ago. In the, and, and the statement that you made that just really got to me was the one about when there are enough women in the pipeline, we'll start seeing them in leadership positions. That's what they told me in the early 1980s. 
That's what they told me. I'm shocked at the lack of progress, and I think your analysis of it is spot on. Um, I'm here to talk about my new book. It's a, it's a memoir, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that's about um, and the, uh, how I represent, in some ways, what this organization, the Impact Organization, is about um, and how you can do it, too. Um, so I've written a memoir. This is the book I'm going to be talking about. And I love showing these two pictures because I haven't changed a bit. Um, and that first picture was taken in 1975. Um, the, um, I, I want to talk about why a memoir. Uh, because I write books about food politics. They're nonfiction books. Um, and the way I like to put it is, this is my first work of fiction. Uh, the, um, the memoirs are about memory. Mine isn't any better than anybody else's. And the, uh, it, it has a specific reason for being written. Um, first of all, the pandemic <clears throat> created a space in my life and in everybody else's life. And it also changed my physical space because I moved from Manhattan to be with my partner who lives in Ithaca, New York, which is four and a half mile, four and a half hours away from Manhattan, um, and is a much quieter venue than, than Manhattan. I had a lot of time on my hands. And I couldn't do the kind of research that I usually do. The libraries were closed. My office was closed. I couldn't get into any of that stuff. So I thought, OK, maybe this is the time to address the questions that I get asked all the time uh, by students, by reporters, by colleagues, by just random people who come to my lectures. How did you do it? Why did you do it? How did you get interested in nutrition? How did you get interested in food? How did you get interested in food politics? How do you feel about the food industry attacking you? Um, what do you eat? Um, you know, those kinds of really personal questions, and then the one that really gets to me because I don't know how to answer it. How would you assess your legacy? How's that? for a question to answer. So I thought, OK, maybe I'll grapple with that. I've got the space and time to reflect back on those questions, take them seriously, and to try to put together something where if anybody ever asks me those questions again, I could just say, hello, read this. Um, so that would be terrific. And I think then that, that also underlying this was uh, perhaps some understanding that by the time I got the book written, I could see that my life reflected a bunch of themes that might be of common interest. One is the effect of childhood on in forming character and the lasting effects of childhood. Another is the women in science issue, which you just heard about, and how you go about overcoming those kinds of barriers. Uh, sheer persistence. Uh, the reason that this book is called Slow Cooked is because I was well into my 60s by the time food politics came out. Um, and then how uh, lasting values can, can inform a life and make you feel good about getting up every day. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit. And um, it never occurred to me at any time uh, at any point in my career, that I would be considered the most powerful foodie taking on the soda giants. It also never occurred to me that I would be featured in activist facts as one of the country's most hysterical anti-food industry fanatics. That's me. Um, so that all came as a surprise. And it came as a surprise because my degree was in molecular biology. I got it from Berkeley in 1968. I expected to be a bench scientist and to have a, I was a nucleic, for those of you who know this field, I was a nucleic acid enzymologist before restriction enzymes were discovered. I can't tell you how antediluvian that was. But I loved food right from the beginning. I had discovered food as a child. I really liked it. And I loved the way that food 
um, had dimensions that were scientific, but also historical, sociological, anthropological. Um, they embodied social values. They embodied health values. Um, they deal with policy. You could deal with economics. I've always really loved food. And my first post-doctoral position and faculty position was at Brandeis University, where I was in the biology department, basically from 1968 to 1976. And that department had this odd rule about how you could only teach the same course three times in a row, and then you had to switch. And you had to switch to whatever the department needed, whether you knew anything about it or not. And when my three semesters of teaching cell and molecular biology were up, students were asking for human biology classes, and they asked me if I would teach a nutrition course. I agreed to do it. I was interested in nutrition. It had something to do with food. I liked food. And I taught my first class in the 1975-1976 academic year. And I write from the beginning. I was talking about food in many, many dimensions. I used as texts in that first class, among others, Diet for a Small Planet, which had just come out and is now in its 50th anniversary edition. Uh, Center for Science in the Public Interest had just been founded and had published a book called Food for People, Not for Profit that could have been printed yesterday because it's a compendium of everything about food from agriculture to um, consumption to public health, what we would now call food systems. There it was in this book. And then I used articles from the New York Review of Books that came out that year uh, by a historian named Jeffrey Baraclou, who was teaching at Brandeis. And he had written these two amazing political articles about wealth and power and the politics of food and oil, uh, equating food with oil politics and sort of a, a very food systems approach to bringing those together. And that was my first class in, in nutrition. Um, at the end of 1976, my husband at the time was being recruited to UCSF to chair the neurobiology department, and I came along as a trailing spouse. I had no idea what that meant. But the dean at the time, Julius Crevens, created a position for me because I had been teaching nutrition at Brandeis. Um, and he created what seemed like an astonishing position. I was the associate dean for human biology problems, uh, for human biology programs, <laughs> sorry. Um, the problem wasn't them. The problem was the rest of the university. Uh, they were pretty terrific programs, and one of them was uh, was health policy, and there was uh, medical anthropology, medical sociology, medical history, and other such programs. Um, although it was the human bi biology programs as a coherent whole were meant to be a fifth school at NYU. At a fifth school at UCSF, um, at the School of Human Biology, but it didn't exist, and it never did, and it never was going to exist. So what I actually did at UCSF, since the School of Human Biology was not created, was I did Nutrition UCSF, which meant giving lectures, organizing courses, uh, doing ward rounds, doing everything about trying to get nutrition into every part of the UCSF curriculum. We had a federal grant for a couple of years that made that, that made the program possible, and quite a lot of that uh, existed during the time I was here. Some of it still exists. I also took on direction of the first year biochemistry course. I wrote the grant for and uh, did the administrative work for the medical scientist training program, the MD-PhD program. Um, I ran a support group for women medical students. The women medical students were starting to come into UCSF and they were kind of shocked by the way that their courses, the instructors in their courses, used pictures of nude women to illustrate anatomical points and so forth. And uh, the university thought that you can't really change the instructors. Okay, let's teach the women students how to deal with it. 
And so they organized support groups for women students. And I was assigned to work with Dr. Loma Flowers. And if any of you know her, you know how lucky I was uh, to be assigned to work with her. She's been a lifelong friend. Um, I also chaired the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on the Status of Women. And all I can tell you is that none of that did me any good at all. And on the side, I was learning to deal with the media. This is relevant to the kinds of things that Impact is worried about. I was learning to deal with the, me with the media. I tell the story in the book of my nightmarish first appearance on KQED's Over Easy, um, which was rehearsed and the host asked something that wasn't in the rehearsal, and it was a mess. But eventually, I learned to do that. Um, and this is a, a screenshot from one of the programs I did. Um, and I wrote papers in 1982 for the Journal of Perineral and Enteral Nutrition. I wrote a book about, uh, I wrote a paper about nutrition instruction um, in, for, for medical students and practitioners. I wrote a paper with Phil Lee and Bobby Barron uh, in 1983. It was my first nutrition policy paper. And then I'm still writing about um, nutrition in medical education. In 1988, I edited a supplement on nutrition in medical education for the Journal of Nutrition Education. And then Bobby Barron and I wrote a paper for JAMA Internal Medicine in 2014. Um, nothing has changed, is all I can say. When I was first teaching nutrition to medical students in the late 1970s, it had been about 20 years since the first conference on introducing nutrition concepts into the medical curriculum. Um, and those conferences have still continued, and it's still not in the medical curriculum for the same reasons now that it wasn't in then, because we don't fund preventive health care in this country. We fund treatment. Um, and until that changes, it, um, it's not going to ch Until that changes, we're stuck. Um, I also wrote a book on nutrition for medical students who didn't have nutrition in their curriculum. And last year, I w when I was, I was talking about this kind of thing to somebody, I looked up to see if there were any copies of the book on Amazon, and there was for $930. Um, it's not there now. <laughs> Does that mean that somebody paid that kind of money for that book? I wouldn't advise it. Um, so I want, to I want to stop here and talk a little bit about what it was like to be at UCSF. Since I'm at UCSF, um, it seems like, so I'm going to read a couple of short excerpts from the book. Um, um, first of all, to talk about my associate dean job, because this is just so exactly illustrates what Catherine was talking about. The dean's office paid my salary and gave me an office. Officially, I was the Associate Dean for Human Biology programs, bizarre as it now seems. This meant I was responsible for something that did not exist, UCSF's proposed School of Human Biology. The proposed school had been a pet project of Philip Lee, a former US Assistant Secretary for Health, who was then heading up UCSF's Health Policy Institute, which is now named after him. Always ahead of his time, Lee wanted the School of Human Biology to focus on disease prevention, health education, and socioeconomic determinants of disease risk, and to unite UCSF's small but distinguished medical humanities programs in history, sociology, anthropology, psychology, biomedical engineering, and health policy. In theory, the school's aims were a perfect fit with my interests in nutrition. But in practice, California legislatures, legislators had never funded the school, and it did not take long for me to realize that they never would. Medical school leaders and the scientific elite viewed the human biology programs as soft, meaning unscientific, non-rigorous, the most dismissive thing anyone can say about research, and not worth funding. Indeed, they viewed the work of medical humanities fa faculty as non-research. From the perspective of the medical school, which aspired to and soon attained high national status, the only research that counted was laboratory-based 
and worthy of publication in prestigious journals like Science, Nature, Cell, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Dean Crevins, Julius Crevins, made it clear that my job was to keep the proposed school on the back burner and devote no effort to making it happen, and I was too new and uncertain about my position to object or try to do otherwise. Something that I have to say I have regretted ever since. Um, so I stayed at UCSF. I was at UCSF for about eight years before all hell broke loose. And the, at the end of eight years, um, my marriage was in trouble. And remember, I had been a trailing spouse. Um, and a new dean came in. And the new dean replaced Julius Crevins. And in my um, first meeting with him, he said, I just can't understand what you're doing here. Um, you know, you're, you've got a doctorate, but you're not doing research. You don't have an MD. It's too bad that you don't have an MD. If you had an MD, you could be teaching nutrition to medical students. Um, so, I mean, he had no idea what I was doing or um, whether it was any good or not. And it was clear, and I got moved out of the office with the gorgeous view into one that overlooked the Moffat Hospital parking garage. And then I got moved to the bottom of the parking garage, which is where family, I was rescued by Dave Werdiger, who was the head of family medicine at the time. And my office was then a windowless office in the um, basement of the parking garage. So, you know, the message was pretty clear uh, that I was being squeezed out, and, but I didn't really understand what was going on. So this section is called, At Last Some Good Advice. I still had the title of associate dean, but could no longer ignore the vulnerability of my position. I did not have a mentor. How handicapped I was without one. I sought advice from Phil Lee, who headed the Health Policy Institute. I knew him to be highly experienced in academic and national politics, thoughtful and generous with his time and attention. During our meeting, I did what women, particularly at medical schools, are never, ever supposed to do. I cried and couldn't stop. Um, Phil heard me out. What he said should not have come as a surprise, but did. You have to resign. Deans get to choose their own associate deans. Um, Schmidt did not choose you. You need to resign. More tears. But then he added, and here's how you do it. He pointed to my lack of academic credentials in nutrition. I needed to do something about that. Tell Rudy Schmidt you're sorry things aren't working out. Ask him to help you with the next stage of your career. Ask for two years of salary support while you go to public health school and get a master's degree in public health. Promise him that you will leave UCSF in two years. I was stunned. Was such a deal even possible? It took me weeks to work up the nerve to act on his advice, mainly because my personal life was falling apart at the time. When I finally invoked Philly's script, which I followed to the letter, Schmidt looked surprised, hesitated for a moment, and said he would discuss it with the school's financial officer and let me know. No more than 10 minutes later, the time it took me to get back to my basement office, I found a message clipped to my office phone. The dean had accepted my proposal and was drafting a confirming letter. For once, being the only woman on the dean's staff worked to my advantage. I would leave quietly without a fuss in return for two years of salary support. This would give me the time to get my life together personally, as well as professionally. So those are the two excerpts, and now I'll go on to talk about what happened next, um, if I can get the thing to move. Um, I did go to public health school, and on the basis of that um, degree, I got a job with the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in Washington, D.C., where I worked from 1986 to 1988 as the editor of the Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health, which came out in late June 1988. Um, I did not actually work for the Surgeon General. I worked for the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, which was, which was not even under, it was under, but 
the director of the office wanted the Surgeon General's name on the report, so it would be equivalent to the uh, Surgeon General's report on smoking and its impact. And this is a screenshot from um, C. Everett Koop, who was uh, Surgeon General at the time, gave a speech at the launch of the Surgeon General's report, which I had written. I was staff. One of the things I did was write speeches. And one of the weirdest experiences of my life was sitting there listening to Everett Koop channel me. Speaking, speaking in my voice. I mean, it could have been. Not the, it was just the strangest experience. Um, but uh, he did that, and the report came out. The report came out on my watch, and that was very good. And it led to my getting the job at UCSF at um, NYU. I'm sorry, I keep getting them confused. Um, I went to NYU in the fall of 1988. Um, largely on the basis of having done this report in my Washington experience. I've been at there ever since. I've been affiliated with NYU ever since. And I have to say it's been a very, very happy experience for me, uh, largely because NYU's faculty expectations are just what I wanted to do, research, teach, and do public service around the issues of food and food politics. So when I get asked the question, how did I do what I did, I have a one-word answer to it. I came to NYU with tenure. I came as a full professor with tenure. Um, you know, a, a, a miracle in itself, and I tell the story in the book of how that came about. But it made an enormous difference to me. There may be people who get tenure and never do another thing in their entire life. Uh, that wasn't my experience. For me, it was a platform. It opened up the possibility of doing what I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it uh, with real job security. It was the first time I'd ever had security. And I went there, I should say, to chair a department of home economics. This is a, this is a long story. Um, the turning point for me, uh, and in answer to the question, how did you get started on food politics? I mean, I've already said I was already interested in food politics, but I, the, the turning point was a meeting that I went to in 1991 at the National Cancer Institute, uh, where I heard speeches from anti-smoking advocates on cigarette marketing. Uh, to adults and in particular to children. This was a paper by John Pierce, and John Pierce spoke at, who's a anti-smoking researcher at the University of California, San, San Diego. And he gave a slideshow on mo cigarette marketing to children that was revelatory to me. It wasn't that I didn't know that cigarette companies marketed to children. I had just never paid any attention to it. And somehow seeing slide after slide after slide of Joe Camel in places where kids hung out was just revelatory. And I walked out of that meeting saying, we should be doing this to, for Coca-Cola. Um, and so that's what happened. I started paying attention to how food companies were marketing to adults and children and started writing papers about it um, and started writing about the relationship of big food, big agriculture, the research university, and the effects of that on what we eat. Um, I'm still writing about those things. And so my most recent papers have, I write heavily footnoted editorials is basically what I do. And my two most recent papers in the American Journal of Public Health and in JAMA Internal Medicine um, have to do with the politics of regulating the food industry and the politics of why aren't we doing more policy around obesity. Um, my most recent uh, chapter, Laura, have you seen this yet? It's, the book is out. The book is out, and uh, Laura and I and two other and. Two other people have a chapter in this book on sugar-sweetened beverages. The book just came out this week. So that's my research. Um, on the teaching side, the wonderful thing about NYU was that I was able to teach anything I wanted, particularly because I was department chair for a really long time. Um, and I taught courses on food policy and politics and on aspects of the food movement, on the farm bill, food ethics. And I taught courses on food advocacy, how you go about advocating. Um, and then on the public service side, 
New York University, again, a perfect fit because it describes itself as a private university in the public service. Um, and the public service, everything that I do in the way of public lectures like this, media interviews, writing for the medium, the blog that I write almost every day, and Twitter, which, and I'll talk about these, um, all fall under the heading of, perf of public service. So I can put what I do into categories and in my annual faculty reports, I can list lots and lots of things that I've been doing and it makes my university extremely happy. Um, so I'll give some examples of this. I talk to reporters every day, mostly by email, sometimes by phone, sometimes by video. Uh, this is the most recent one, an article by Anahat O'Connor, who's around here someplace and is now writing for the Washington Post. Um, and he interviewed me about um, a report that came out last week or the week before about how the American, the Dietetic Association, now called the Academy of, of um, Nutrition and Dietetics, um, is, has, is very tightly linked to food companies. And in fact, the Academy owns stock in Nestle, no relation, and in um, PepsiCo. And th even I was shocked by that. Really, they own stock in companies in, in, that make junk food and ultra-processed foods that are exactly the kind of thing that dietitians should be advising people not to eat. That didn't make any sense to me. So that's that quote. Uh, my most recent article for any kind of news outlet um, was in October in STAT, where STAT asked me if I would write something about the FDA's new uh, decision to define healthy. Um, you know, was that going to be good, bad, or indifferent? And I did a podcast with the, the guy who was the editor at STAT, who was just a terrific interviewer was really nice to do that. So, um, you know, the scientists are under pressure to use social media. Um, I use social media. I can't say that I went into it very enthusiastically. Uh, for one thing, I'm not very technically adept. And so the technical details of these things are very difficult. But I got involved in blogging because I couldn't say no. When my book, uh, What to Eat, came out in paperback in 2007, Farris Strauss and Giroux, the publisher, asked, uh, was interested in using social media to sell books, and they asked if I would be a guinea pig and would start writing a daily blog. And I was horrified at the thought. I thought this was going to be an enormous time sink. It was going to be something that was really difficult, of uncertain benefit, um, I really, really was reluctant about it, but I agreed to do it for six months, or uh, there was a, the deal was a one-year trial. And they said they would pay to build the site, and that was the determining factor, and I, because they sunk a lot of money into the first website that I had, which was under the heading of whattoeatbook.com, which I never liked, and got rid of it as soon as I could. Um, and so some years later, when I had other books out, I consolidated everything that I was doing onto my current website, which is foodpolitics.com. Um, and here's the, I think that's today's, what it looks like today. So you're on it on today's, um, or this talk is on it on today's blog post. And I've done it since, like, since 2007, and a completely reasonable question is why? Um, and the answer is that it keeps me up on current events. It forces me to stay on top of what's going on, to answer questions for reporters. I can, you know, if reporters ask me a question, I could say I did a blog post on it last week. Um, also, they tell me what's new and exciting and different in the field. They tell me about papers I've never heard of. Um, they're usually really interesting to talk to. They force me, it forces me to organize my thinking in a coherent way. Um, and I get to use it to promote ideas, to promote other people's books, to promote reports that I think are interesting, and to do a lot of advocacy for the ideas that I want to advocate for. So that's the blog. Um, 
And if and it's very easy to subscribe to. You just click into that button. And then there's Twitter. Well, it's hard to talk about Twitter this week, but uh, I started on Twitter in 2009 uh, because somebody said you should be on Twitter. And they set it up so that my blog would go over, it would go out over Twitter automatically so I wouldn't have to do anything. Uh, that seemed good because, again, there's the technological stuff that's really difficult. I thought Twitter was inane. I thought it was a waste of time. And once again, its benefit was very uncertain. Um, I'm still tweeting. You know, many years later, many years and 140,000 followers later, um, I'm still doing it. And it, too, has benefits. So there's the obvious thing that the blog goes out over Twitter. I don't have to do any work. But I find it to be a very useful uh, source of information about things I wouldn't otherwise know about um, in my field. Um, it gives me a chance to share information. And when I'm waiting online and bored out of my mind, it's very distracting. So, so the situation on Twitter right now, um, The Atlantic just had an article this week that Twitter's problems are bigger than Elon Musk. Um, social media has risks, and Twitter illustrates it. It takes up a lot of time sometimes. The links disappear, and so the... Um, you know, you can go back and look at old uh, blog posts or old tweets, and the, the links are gone, and that's very unfortunate. And then you have to deal with negative feedback and trolls. And I have had my share of trolling. Um, for some reason or other, I made a slide of this one some years ago, but it was typical of a lot of messages that I was getting on my uh, blog site, um, and I didn't like it. And the people who were reading my blog didn't like it, and I had to stop comments. So I stopped comments on my blog uh, when I was being delusional. I thought somebody was paying someone to, um, to, to do these because a lot of them came from the same IP addresses. Um, and, those, and I have a cybersecurity friend who traced the IP addresses back to a spam site in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and I thought, if this is organized and these, are being, these people are being paid to do this, really, I don't need it. So I stopped comments on my blog. And I do regret that, because the comments were interesting and also kept me up on things. Um, anyway, no more. So I'm concerned about the fact that Americans don't trust science take on food issues. I think there are lots of reasons for that, but one is that scientists aren't out front and transparent about their opinions and their beliefs and um, arguing about them. Um, present company accepted, of course. Uh, and I'm greatly in favor of, advocate, of advocating. I try to be completely transparent about my own beliefs, and I try to back them up with an extraordinary amount of research so that every word that I say is backed up with a reference and the kinds of things that I'm advocating for these days are curbs on food industry marketing practices. I'm um, advocating for much more attention to social and behavioral determinants of health and nutrition and diets, food systems approaches to dietary, uh, to diets and dietary advice. And on the dietary advice side, I think that the concept of ultra-processed is the most important nutrition concept to come along in years, um, and that we should be telling everybody to stop eating and drinking ultra-processed foods. Um, we should be looking at diets that perform triple duty, meaning preventing hunger, preventing obesity-related chronic disease, and preventing climate change at the same time. And fortunately, that kind of diet is so simple that Michael Pollan can do it in his famous seven-word semi-haiku. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. If you define food as anything that's not ultra-processed, you got it. And that's really all you have to do. So I think that all of this is really important. Um, I'm, it's something that I've always done. It's something that I believe in very strongly. Um, I think this is what democracy is about, and you can use food to discuss democratic concepts in ways that you really can't talk about them in many, many other ways. 
Um, and so I will leave you with uh, my mantra, which is uh, vote with your fork. The food choices that you make have an impact on our food system, but even more, you should vote with your vote, which means get involved in politics and get involved in policy. Um, and this is the kind of thing that runs throughout my book. Um, I hope you'll try to find it somewhere. There are cards running around about how you can get it, and that's it. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. What happens now? <laughs> oh, questions. Thank you. That was um, very inspirational for me. I feel like we've had two topics, one of women in science and one of nutrition. And I've always um, wondered the extent to which nutrition, because it is associated with cooking and food, which are traditionally gendered activities, might be taken less seriously, and particularly less seriously in a professional space like a medical school, because it's women's work. I wonder if you might reflect on the intersection between being a woman in science and particularly in yeah. nutrition. I mean, I, t I talk about that in the memoir about how food was not taken seriously. Um, you know, I mean, if, if your hierarchy is basic biomedical research um, and you don't think that humanities pro researchers are doing research, you count anything other than basic biomedical research as non-research, then food is way down at the the bottom. I mean, what was in, and that's part of why it's not taught in medical schools. Nobody takes it seriously. When we started our food studies programs, undergraduate, masters, and doctoral at NYU in 1996, the first question was, what's that? Why would anybody want to study about food? You know, fortunately, people aren't asking that so much anymore as more and more universities are teaching food in every conceivable department that, that you can even think of. I mean, food is now integrated into practically every academic department. It's becoming a little bit easier, at least through that, but I don't think you're going to change that at a medical school where basic biomedical research is what it's about. And I talk a lot about that in the UCSF chapter in this book because I was confronted with it constantly. You know, even though we had an enormously successful um, nutrition education program, though, the, um, in the sense that there were lots and lots of people in it, I'll give you another example. Um, I did ward rounds at San Francisco General and I was in family medicine. And the first time that I appeared on the ward to do it, the chief resident had forgotten that I was coming. And she said, with just dismay in her voice, we don't have any nutrition problems on the floor. <laughs> and I said, why don't I just go around with you? And you know, there wasn't a single patient who wasn't in desperate need of nutrition intervention. You know, and so in that first session, I was able at least to teach the residents to maybe call a dietitian to come in and meet with these patients. I don't know. It's been an uphill battle. It's never stopped. I think it's getting better. I really do. But I don't think it's getting better at medical schools unless there is a powerful faculty member who is running a really exciting program that's getting a lot of money. So then it might work. And yes, remember I started out as the chair of a home economics department. Hi, I'm Chris Schaefer from the UCSF Library. Can you take your mask off? I just can't hear. Oh, sorry. Uh, Chris <laughs> Schaefer from the UCSF Library. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. Can you talk a little bit about the intersection between food and nutrition and agriculture research? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was very late 
in coming to agriculture and understanding what it was about. You know, I went to Berkeley hoping to study food. And the choices were dietetics or agriculture. I was a city girl. I didn't get agriculture. Um, and I was lasted in dietetics one day. I tell that story, too, in the book. I don't think you can understand why people eat the way they do unless you understand the agricultural system and the need to transform our current agricultural system from one focused on feeding animals and fueling automobiles uh, to one that is focused on food for people. You know, we don't have an agriculture system that's, that does much about food for people. It's got tokens. Um, rounding errors of money that are involved in pushing food for people, but it's not what it's about. Um, it's about, you know, and if we're trying to get people to eat less meat, then our agricultural system is working at cross purposes. One reason why we have so much meat is that feed is cheap because that's what's subsidized. So, um, you know, I, I, so I'm, uh, if you, if I had a diagram of a food system up there, it would stop, it would start with food production and end with food waste and in a, in a cycle. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's what you're asking, but, you know, Davis is the, ag is the land grant agricultural part of the University of uh, California system, and it's a very complicated place from, <laughs> politically, and the, um, my department at NYU now has an urban farm. It took seven years to get it. It's not very large. It's what, the size of the, it's about the size of this stage. This is about it. Um, but oh, yeah, we're teaching agriculture. And I should say that when the food studies program started, at NYU, the New York Times wrote about them, and they interviewed Alice Waters. And Alice Waters made some comment that I thought was really snippy about how can they run a food studies program and not teach students about farming? And I thought, you know, has she seen where NYU is? What are we supposed to do, take over Washington Square and grow vegetables in the middle of all those rats? Um, and people selling drugs at the time, but she was absolutely right, as Alice Waters almost always is. <laughs> oh, does that answer your question? So I'm an enthusiastic supporter of agriculture and agricultural research. I think we need it badly. Thank you, I think I have two questions. Um, when I read Food Politics, I was like really interested in the notion of keeping the public puzzled as a very important industry strategy. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on, on that notion, keeping the public puzzled. Keeping the public what? Puzzled. Puzzled? Confused. Puzzled? Confused, keeping the public confused, yes! Yes, let's keep the public confused. You, you know, I, I mean, I, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that. I mean, Michael Pollan is brilliant, and this is one of the one of the most brilliant things he's ever done. Dietary advice is really simple. People don't believe this. They think I'm joking. I'm not. You know, this le this formulation leaves all kinds of dietary patterns. It leaves deliciousness. It leaves cultural practices. It leaves religion. It it, it encompasses everything. But if you're a food company and you're selling an ultra-processed product, you want the public to be as confused as possible. And so how do you do that? You cast doubt on the research. You do your own research. You focus on nutrients rather than foods. You never talk about meat. You talk about saturated fat. You don't talk about sodas, you talk about sugar, although sugar's not bad either, but people have to know where that sugar is. Uh, you don't talk about salt, you, talk, I mean, you don't talk about snack foods, you talk about salt. And you leave it up to individuals to make those decisions. You don't do policy. Um, any, any study that comes out that I mean, look, think of the number of studies that you've seen that say everything you knew about nutrition is wrong. 
you know, that should be a red flag for we are trying to confuse the public. Because if the public ate like this, nobody would make any money. The food industry's billion dollar ultra processed products wouldn't sell. So of course they're going to confuse the public. Rob. Um, one of the th good things about Obamacare, and we can talk about the pluses or minuses, mm -hmm. was the fact that they capped uh, insurance company profits at 15%. Mm -hmm. Any more than that, they had to give back to the subscribers. And all of a sudden, the insurance industry realized, we can't make money by people being sick, and the problem is they don't know how for people to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Given that the food industry, the ultra-processed food industry, for every dollar, 19% of it goes to the food and 81% of it goes to the marketing, mm -hmm. um, does it make sense to perhaps um, uh, you know, do the same thing mm -hmm. for the food industry as we did for Obamacare? You know, cap at mm -hmm. a very specific rate. There's just an article in the New York Times just today about the fact that um, uh, food company profits have gone through the roof and uh, Joe Biden's uh, basically telling everybody to eat generic raisin bran because of it. He's, he's doing what? Telling people to not eat Kellogg's raisin bran, but generic raisin bran because it's a dollar cheaper. This is crazy. Oh, yeah. That's, um, you know, in public health terms, that's as downstream as you get. And what you really want is upstream policy. Um, you know, I'm all for regulating the food industry. Good luck with that. Um, in 2019, oh, well, I don't know. You need, you need political will, and you need everybody to be ready to do this. The, the, in 2019, uh, a commission of the Lancet called the Glo un with the unfortunate name of the Global Syndemic um, report, uh, because you don't know what it means, and it's, it's obfuscating. But it's an absolutely incredible report. And it's the first report I've ever seen that talked about the need to regulate the food industry. And it defined the whole problem of people eating um, bad diets, that are diets that are really not good for them, as one for which the food industry was largely responsible, and, and the fact that you couldn't do anything about it for three reasons, because government is weak and captured by corporations, because civic society is weak and because the food industry is very strong and very focused. I mean, I'm, I'm always saying that uh, food companies are not social service agencies, they're not public health agencies, they're businesses. Their job is to pr provide immediate high returns to stockholders, and that's really all they're, ba they're about. And if you expect them to do anything else, you don't understand the situation. I mean, they may, there may be executives who want to make healthy foods. I've heard executives say things like, we wish we didn't have to market to children, but our stockholders insist that we do. That's what this is about. So yes, we should be regulating them, we should be capping their profits, and we should be doing all kinds of things. Um, and no, having them reformulate their product to take a gram of sugar out or a gram of salt out is not going to make that much difference. That's why the ultra-processed concept is so important. And, and what it does that really changes things, because uh, it, it, the way I define ultra-processed is that it's industrially produced, it doesn't look like the foods that it came from, and you can't make it in a home kitchen because it's got ingredients or it requires machinery that you don't have in your kitchen. Um, and we now know through hundreds of studies that ultra-processed foods are associated with a higher risk of obesity-related chronic disease. And we now have one absolutely amazing clinical trial that explains why 
because people eat more calories from ultra-processed foods and don't realize it. And not just more calories, but 500 more calories a day, you know, an amount that is absolutely staggering in research terms. You know, you do dietary studies, you're, luck you're lucky if you find a 50-calorie difference. But to find a 500-calorie difference, that's absolutely amazing. So I think this is a really important concept. We should be advising everybody to cut back on ultra-processed foods. The food industry doesn't like that. And the first thing they're doing is casting doubt on the research, complaining about the squishy definition, saying, well, really, these foods don't have anything to do with it. It must be something else. It must be this, that, or the other thing. It can't be the processing. Um, we'll see how that research plays out. But the food industry is very unhappy about it. Um, and that tells you there must be some, something going on. So I'm not sure that answers your question, Rob, but I'm for, I'm for regulation. Um, and I actually didn't know about the 15% cap on the, the insurance industry. I want to know more about that. I have a, uh, yes. Just a, a comment, kind of getting back to the uh, Confusing the consumer and food waste. If you look at the uh, foods that are stamped with best by this date, sometimes it's a food safety issue and sometimes it's a food quality or texture issue. You know, eat by this date. And consumers are throwing away tons and tons, literally, of food that is perfectly good because they're assuming that's a food safety issue date. We need two dating systems, a quality dating system and a food safety dating system. You want me to comment on food waste? Yeah. It's not my issue. Um, it's a feel-good issue. Um, I tend to stay away from feel-good issues. And the reason I say that is that if you look at the big picture of food waste, 70% of the food waste occurs at the production level. You know, it's bad weather, it's stuff that's left on the field, it's vegetables that are the wrong size and shape, um, but that's where the bulk of the food waste problem comes. 10% comes at the grocery store level, and that leaves 20% for throwing away things with wrong sell-by dates on them. Um, I'm in favor of doing something about the 20%. I'm not, not in favor of doing something about the 20%, but I'd rather deal with it at the production level, where the big percentages are. Um, and I know everybody, it makes everybody real, feel really good to try to do something about food waste. And I'm glad you're all doing it. I'm doing it too. It's just not something I want to work on. But thank you for asking. So, Hi. Yeah. Um, I want to. Former student. <laughs> yes. Food studies. No food studies. Food studies. Um, I want to talk a little bit about food as medicine and the sort of movement around food as medicine. And oh what the current opportunities are mm -hmm. in not just at an institution like this, but also in thinking about soil health, thinking about the opportunities in connecting agriculture to human health, and where you see that going in the next few five years. Well, I went to the White House conference on um, food, on hunger, food, and health, and it was a big issue at the White House conference because one of the people who was... Uh, working on the White House conference is a big food as medicine person. And um, food as medicine from that standpoint is prescriptions, is doctors prescribing fruits and vegetables for their patients, um, various kinds of incentives. It's all incentives, systems for um, encouraging people to eat fruits and vegetables. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a food as medicine person either. And the, the way it was, and I'm very uncomfortable about it because I don't think of food, food as medicine. Food is, I think of food as pleasure. You know, food is something that, that's cultural. It brings people together. It promotes health if you're eating real food. It promotes health. It promotes joy. It has all of these things that when you medicalize it, it kind of takes it out of there. The way that it was explained to me was that it's fundable. 
And so, for example, the guy from Tufts said that he wasn't able to get grants on a lot of the things that he was doing, but the minute he glommed onto food as medicine, he got 11 federal grants to work on it. Somebody else said it plays well in Congress. Somebody else said food as medicine plays well with Republicans. That's your answer. So I think it's going to be a really, really hot topic. I've opened up a new file folder on it. I've started putting things into it. I think it's going to be really big, really, really big. I've been told that um, the kinds of groups that everybody is trying to get at resent it enormously. And that feel that they feel that it's um, condescending, it's telling them what to eat, which they don't like, um, and some other things like that. I don't know. We're gonna get all those sociologists and anthropologists out there working on it. But I think it's something we're gonna have to live with, because at a medical school like this, food as medicine is gonna work, and the the other kinds of things aren't. They're just not. And so that that's what, to me that's what it's about. It's about reaching. It's it's about reaching a top down funding and decision making apparatus, top down, not bottom up. As always, nobody is asking communities what they want. As always, we have time for one more question. Actually, that's not true. There are people who are asking communities what they want. Yeah. Thanks so much for such an inspiring talk. You inspired me to go into my career. Um, I wanted to ask you how, if you could describe uh, some like threats you've experienced from the food industry and how you've dealt with I'm sorry, with them. I missed it. Oh, it's really um, hard for me to hear this for some oh, reason. Oh, sure. If you could describe uh, maybe threats you've, you've experienced from the food industry and how you have dealt with them. Ah, um, actually, I've had very, very few direct attacks from food companies. It's usually, the attacks usually come from um, three stages removed. So that, for example, the trolls on my blog, I, were pre I was pretty sure because of the tone and the quality of them and the consistency, and some of them were really funny, that they must have come from the Center for Consumer Freedom, which is a public relations group in Washington that's funded by the food industry. I could never prove it, but that was my suspicion. Um, the... When food politics first came out, there were a bunch of trolly uh, reviews on Amazon that you can still see if you go back to the earliest reviews of food politics on Amazon. Um, and they were, uh, you know, hasn't she ever heard about personal responsibility? Hasn't she ever heard about, you know, people taking responsibility for their own behavior? Um, and again, somebody called them out and said that they must have been paid for. I was threatened with a lawsuit from the Sugar Association when food politics came out, um, and I've got that correspondence on my own blog at the bottom of my publications um, place. And th that was a very funny story because they, um, they said I had defamed sugar. I didn't know that sugar had feelings um, and could be defamed. And the reason I had defamed sugar was that I said that soft drinks contained sugars and nothing else, no nutrients. And they said, you, as a nutritionist, should know better. Soft drinks don't contain sugar. They contain high fructose corn syrup. Um, which I thought was hilariously funny. I mean, I was just laughing and laughing about it because high fructose corn syrup is sugars. Sugars, plural. Um, so, you know, uh, sugar is glucose and fructose stuck together. Corn syrup is glucose and fructose separated. They're sugars. Uh, so I thought it was very funny. And um, people told me, no, 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 this is not funny. They're uh, preparing a veggie libel suit against you, and you need to have a lawyer read these letters, and um, you need to write a response that rebuts every single point, and you have to have a lawyer look at it, and this is beginning to sound very expensive and unpleasant. I'm not very litigious. 
Um, but I did all that, and um, and then never heard another thing about it. But I ran into the head of the Sugar Association at a meeting some months later, and in the meantime, I've been putting quotations in my slides and talking about this because I said I thought it was really funny. These people don't know biochemistry. Um, and, the, uh, and I ran into this guy at a trade show and said, you know, I've just had so much fun with your lawyer's letter. And he said very stiffly, we're just glad you're speaking more precisely now, meaning that I now say sugars instead of sugar. Um, it's two trade associations. The corn, uh, the corn syrup is um, represented by the Corn Refiners Association, and um, cane and beet sugar are represented by the Sugar Association. They don't like each other very much. Uh, you know, they, they compete. And for a long time, corn, the corn sweeteners were cheaper than sugar. They're not anymore now that so much corn is going to ethanol. Uh, the price differential is much smaller. So who knows? They'll even put sugar back into Coca-Cola. Um, that it? Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you.